Uh, so now to the introduction for this session. My job is easy. Everybody knows who Professor Eric von Hippel is in our community, given his legacy of contribution. Given that I've heard rumors that he's got a very good talk for us this morning, <laughs> all I'm going to simply say is that Isbam have kept the best wine to last. Uh, so yeah. Eric, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to be here. And I love being the last presenter because then nobody can say, Eric is entirely wrong, you know, uh, in future talks. So what I'd like to tell you about is something called free innovation. And um, I'll go to the slides and, and I'll try to be very compact and uh, let you know uh, what it's about. I very humbly say, why free innovation is the most important thing you will ever learn about in your entire lives. So now you can see why I'm very happy to go last because uh, nobody can say, no, 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 mine is. Uh, you will find that if you are interested in what I've told you or have, will tell you in 20 minutes, that uh, you can read more about this and the book is free. I, it was a persuasion process to convince my publisher how much more money he'd make if he gave the book away, but there you go. Uh, so you can actually go to my MIT website if you're interested and download the complete book, Free Innovation, should you decide that you want to, because uh, there's much more than we can cover here. Okay, so now let me go ahead. So the first thing is to frame this, and it is in economics, what you see there in that picture is Schumpeter uh, in one of his more cheerful moments. In economics, it's been assumed that producers are the innovators, all right? And the typical linear model that you see here is the model of how innovation is supposed to work. That is market research followed by R&D, production, market diffusion, all by paid employees, right? Schumpeter, again, said it's the producer who initiates economic change and consumers are educated by him if necessary. So it never would have recurred to, to people in Schumpeter's day or even largely today because the entire innovation system is built around producer innovation. It would have never occurred to them that users would come up with their own innovations, not just ideas, but the actual innovations. So market research, for example, would look around to see what we wanted in the way of toothpaste flavors. And then if they decided, they would produce one. So it would never occur to them that we actually would have made our own, for example, rum flavored toothpaste. You know, users simply don't do that. So what we did, colleagues and I, we have in the last 10 years, surveyed 10 countries to try to say to people, listen, consumers actually innovate a lot too. And they do very important things. And when you really look at it, you will discover, dear uh, producers, that a lot of your products that you produce at a profit in the marketplace actually have their roots in what users have developed. Now, the scale of this is enormous. In, uh, in, uh, in uh, this entire 10 country thing, we have about 80 million people innovating. That's huge, absolutely huge. Uh, an example, let's see if I have one. Yeah, an example here in the first study we did to give you a sense of this is that in the UK, 6.1% of the population, when you ask them whether they innovate, and what we do is we ask very carefully and conservatively, what we're interested in is, did you come up with something new that is better than anything else that's on the market, right? It wasn't just something more stylish, it was functionally better. So that's what our metrics are about. When you look at this number of people innovating, it's 6.1% of the population. 
That's 2.9 million people. Now remember, Schumpeter and all the company kind of policy, the patenting and so on, the R&D subsidies is oriented towards producers. But when you look here, for example, in the UK, what you see is that they are spending billions of dollars collectively. They're spending actually more than the producer companies are spending to produce products for users themselves, for consumers. And in fact, 2.9 million people is over a hundred times more innovators than are contained in all the firms producing products for consumers. So in the UK at the time of this survey, there were about 23,000 developers who were paid developers making stuff for consumers. Now, these users give their innovations away. They typically don't protect them. It's amazing. Let me go into further detail. So now what we've discovered that we have is we have a different additional paradigm. You see on the Schumpeterian one on the bottom, it's companies, but invisible to economists, invisible to policymakers, invisible to those of us in business schools who teach you how to innovate. You have this giant free innovation paradigm that also exists. Now the reason it's invisible is that these individuals develop innovations for themselves, no one pays them. So there's no transaction to trace. They don't patent, so there are no patents to trace. And they give away the innovations, so there are no sales to trace. It takes this kind of analysis that we did to find these people. Now, why do these people innovate if nobody's paid them? They innovate because they're self-rewarded. They're doing it for themselves. So specifically, in the case of this sample here in Finland, what you see is a, is a cluster analysis where, where the uh, total population of innovating users is divided up by the biggest motivation they have. So the first thing you'll see is they have a mix of motivations. The second thing you see is that the one on the upper right, upper left, these are people who need it for themselves. Now notice, if you make something for yourself and you use it, you're self-rewarded. You don't have to sell it to anybody. Nobody has to pay you, you're self-rewarded. It's the same on the upper right. A lot of people benefit from the fun and learning of innovating. You know, if they are going down into their basement to create something that they need, they're not saying, oh, darn it, you know, this is so horrible. I have to go down to the basement and work and have fun yet again. They're doing it because they're self-rewarded. Again, nobody has to pay them to have fun. They're having fun in self-reward. They also help other people. And a fraction of these people, less than 10%, 9%, are the source of the entrepreneurial ventures that come out of the household sector. So there are people in the household sector who are innovating with a hope to make money. They tend to patent, but 90% of them are innovating for themselves and giving it away. Now, here's an example of that. Here's a suitcase with an electric motor. You might've seen these and then you saw that uh, things got into trouble because uh, you, know, you couldn't bring batteries on planes really and put them in the hole and these things were uh, driven by electric batteries. But what this was about, it was a farmer in China who decided, you know what, I'm tired of lugging my suitcase. Why shouldn't my suitcase lug me? And so what you see there is he has integrated an electric scooter and a suitcase. And what you then have is his ability to run around airports and so on with the suitcase carrying him. Now, immediately, you see on the lower right-hand side, he didn't patent his innovation. Immediately on the lower right-hand side, you see the Moto Bag company and many other companies too saying, hey, 
that's really good, we'll produce that. They never mention the Chinese farmer. They just say, look at the marvelous thing we have built. And then they continue to build on the myth that basically the producer was the source of the innovation, when in fact the producer was not. Now, uh, we are now developing semantic search methods for user innovations. We can now search the entire web for these kinds of uh, uh, innovations, and, and I won't uh, get into it here, but uh, you should know, and, and there's articles on this, that we can now sort of search all the user-generated content on the web and find tons of these innovations that companies might want to produce for themselves or that users might want to produce because they want one just for themselves. Now here's an example to show you, how am I doing on time here? Um, here's an example to show you how important and strong this thing is. So I'm gonna take about four minutes on this example. This is the development of the artificial pancreas. Now we see a farmer making a, a, a sort of a suitcase, isn't that cute? Yes, but actually household innovators do much more serious things and more important things as well. So an issue with people who have type one diabetes is that they have to do a, about 300, they calculate decisions a day to affect their blood glucose and make choices about how much insulin to take and how much to eat in the way of carbs. So a sample calculation, if they're planning a meal, is they have to correct for their present level of blood glucose. They have to factor in their insulin resistance. They have to factor in whether they have activity. They have to factor in whether they're sitting still or moving around and how much insulin they have on board to come up with a calculation. Now, the problem is that these manual calculations are imprecise and people make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, about one out of 20 type one diabetics over their lifetimes die from a mistake. So this happened to Dana Lewis. She didn't die, but she almost died. What happened was that she, when you take uh, too much um, uh, insulin at bedtime, you can drive your blood sugar down to the level where you go into a coma. And then what happened was for her, she did this, she made a mistake in her calculations. She drove her blood sugar down too low. She woke up, she could see the juice box that she had on her bedside table for such an emergency. But she'd waited too long and she could not move her muscles to pick up the juice box and save her life. So her husband, then PNC Scott Liebrand, saved her. Now, after that, she was afraid to sleep, as you and I would probably be too. So Scott said, we've got to do something about that. Producers said, well, you know, we'll get to it. Wait five years and we'll have an artificial pancreas. But, you know, Dana and her husband said, you know what? We don't want to wait. We need it now. So here's how an artificial pancreas works. You have a continuous blood glucose measuring device. You measure somehow, whether automatically or manually. In the case of the uh, artificial pancreas, it's automatically. Then you have an insulin pump. And these two things are separated by your calculating in the middle by yourself. What they wanted to do to make an artificial pancreas was to insert an automatic calculator into the middle. So it would take Dana's rules and it would automatically calculate how much insulin she needed and use the pump to provide it. So they actually built these things. Companies hadn't built it. Remember, this is quite sophisticated. How is it possible that they could do this? The answer is that consumers are all of you all the sophisticated people who are working inside your companies during the day, go home at night, bringing your skills with you. And these days, with the ability to do a digital kind of design using software that's free, 
and these kinds of computers and so on and communicate with others, the whole thing has become something where the consumer community can do as well as producers. Okay, so here they built on the left their first one, then they built on the right a next one using a Raspberry Pi computer. And then Dana was brave enough to actually do this. So she hooked it all up and she found out that my gosh, this thing really works and it keeps my blood sugar better in range than my manual methods. Now in 2017, hundreds of others then adopted the DIY design. And now today, thousands have. So here's the situation. Again, user innovation, as I showed you, where is the image? The user pioneered, look at the top arrow, the user Dana and her husband and others who joined pioneered the innovation. The companies didn't want to for various reasons we don't have to get into. Basically, they were afraid of the liability risks of actually having sort of calculating your insulin dose for you. So the users did it. They shared the process. And then you had peer-to-peer -peer free diffusion. In other words, they gave their design away. Now, I would submit to you, this is a fantastic new mechanism, which is going to compete more and more seriously with producer design. Why? Because companies might have five or six engineers working on a project like this. Consumers who decide that they need it can post on the web what they're doing. And just like in the case of Linux, you can end up with hundreds or thousands of people working together. They vastly outscale what the producers are doing. And the quality of their abilities is huge as well. People participating in this were software engineers, but they were also the people running the control functions for oil refineries, because in a sense, it's a similar kind of an analysis. So world-class experts were doing this kind of work. All right, so now let me jump to what, how this matters for you. Basically, what we see here is on the top arrow, we see innovators creating things. Now they create things, they generally, you can see that the top arrow begins before the bottom arrow. This is because individual users only have to care about their own needs. They don't have to care about whether there's a market. So since a market becomes visible only after there's something that people are using, you end up with the evidence that individual users need being available for them before it's available to producers. Let's take the example of the mountain bike, which you see here. All it took was some people deciding they wanted to do mountain biking. There was no available bike that was suitable for use riding down mountains. So they built their own. Hundreds joined them, thousands joined them. And then a company said, well, oh, okay. Now that we see that thousands of people are doing this, I guess we will commercially manufacture the user design, which is what you see on the bottom, okay? So it is, as we have shown, in various areas, it's a huge source of basically prototypes for companies to pick up on. They don't have to go around anymore and say, I wonder what people want. They have proven prototypes out there that they can build upon and build their product lines upon. When we study in a particular industry, for example, you see in the bottom, whitewater kayaking, three out of four of the innovations developed that were important in that field were developed by users and the design savings for producers were three times the actual amount they spent over 50 years in developing products for that market. Okay, so that's one way that you as producers can benefit from the fact that these people are out there innovating and giving their designs away. Now notice they're not working very hard to give their designs away because they don't make any money from you. So you've got to search. Now, 
Here's another really important thing that consumer innovators do for you. They've got a whole system of use. They, in order to enjoy their mountain bike and give it value, they actually have to develop riding techniques. A bike is only good if you can do stuff with it. Companies cannot make money off teaching riding techniques. People teach each other. So it's what's called a free complement. Companies, however, benefit because every time a user develops a new jumping technique or something, you end up with the value of what they do sell, namely the bike, increasing at no cost to themselves. Well, okay, so there are other ways that these two paradigms interact, namely uh, free can compete with producer products. And also, you have systems in place now where you as companies can support your particular users to get them to innovate in directions of interest to you. This is the final slide I'll mention here. So basically what you are in the position of doing is saying, oh wow, those guys innovate. Let's give them tools. Let's let them innovate on a site we manage. We can observe who's doing what, we can observe who finds it popular, and we can incorporate some of those innovations in our own product. So here, the example you see on the right-hand side is that uh, a company called Valve has created, quote, Steam Workshop. It's a company that makes uh, video games. They know users hack their games. They create a place where they can hack their games. They learn from the downloads of what the people do, and then they, in fact, incorporate some of those innovations in their games. Let me stop here. Uh, let me go back to, for our discussion purposes, to here. Basically, that's what I want to show you. There's this magic free source of innovation out there that only has come into focus recently. We think it's going to be a great advantage to you as producers or entrepreneurs to understand this and take advantage of it. Okay, that's it. Let me stop. Questions, answers, comments, whatever you like. Well, thank you very much there, Eric. We have over 177 participants listening in, and as the questions are flying in here, I think we would be here all night and i get shot by ISBAM if I didn't uh, just pick the ones that are popping to the top here. I have one here, which is kind of a, a big question. Pick the ones that are popping to the top here. I have one here, which is kind of a, a big question. How is a firm supposed to filter the uh, user innovations to find the best ones? Well, the users filter for themselves. You have to remember that what you're interested in is not the first mountain bike. What happens is you see thousands of people using mountain bikes. If it's not a popular thing and others don't pick it up, there's no market advantage for you. So just look at what the users are self-adopting. Okay. And in relation to, for a company that wishes to harness this, these, uh, these user uh, innovations, how do they, is there a way that they should appropriate value sustainably so that they can actually, you know, reward the, the user or to not do damage to that source of innovation? They can build a relationship and they should. So if you think about Lego, for instance, Lego sits there and says, oh my gosh, there are tons and tons of people developing new kinds of Lego models. How do we learn from them? And the people are showing their Lego models in all these meets and the rest of it. And then Lego very reasonably says, well, if we want to commercialize one of these, how do we, how do we deal with them? And what they do, what they have learned is that these people don't necessarily want money at all. What they want is Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. So since often these things are community developed, they give tons of Lego bricks to the user communities. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, a specific appropriate way to give back and forth. So, so what you have to do is you have to sense what your users care about 
and build a relationship. And further, they won't necessarily come to your site. Lego is so powerful, they will, but you can join their site. You join a mountain biking club, you interact, you learn, you see what's popular, and then you give back. Okay. Obviously, we're in a very strange time at the moment with, uh, with coronavirus and the, the, what they're referring to as the new norm. But what do you see is your opinion on the physical infrastructure of innovation that this will bring about uh, or in terms of this sharing economy and so on? Well, it's amazing. Basically, because we have the internet, people can share find each other and because we have digital design tools people can design in ways where they can transfer the design to each other in a 3d printable form or whatever and share so uh basically what you will see is increased investment in things like maker spaces increased investment in things like thingiverse which is a place for people to post their designs and infrastructure is developing that governments can support just as they support uh, producer innovation with patents. And in fact, we just this last year managed to get the OECD to change its definition of innovation to include this kind of source. And as you can imagine, getting the OECD to change anything is like tipping the earth on its axis. So it's happening. And as you see in COVID, you know, you saw all the amazing responses of people who are users solving, you know, the ventilator problems for themselves and all the rest of it. So all of a sudden, I think to many of us, this kind of activity was very visible for the first time. Thank you. Just focusing in on that, because it's a pet area I'm looking at myself. Obviously, the users engaging and they're 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 using harnessing their capabilities to be very creative and very imaginative. But do you see that there's the possibility of them bringing that all the way to physical solutions for the market, or do you see that it's more that the user will remain primarily at the explorative end of the innovation process, and the companies have to come in? Well, companies should come in, but the point is that users are developing things to the state they need them themselves. Mm -hmm. So you saw, for instance, in hospitals, you saw the nurses making a ventilator serve to, to, to patients. You probably saw that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So for that to be any good to them, they had to make it work. Mm -hmm. They weren't sitting around saying to a company, oh, I wish you would come up with this and then we'll see if it's any good. They could turn around to the company and they could say, this works within use. Mm -hmm. Now a company can say, okay, let me build that feature into ventilators in some commercial way. But companies are so goddamn slow that the COVID crisis will be over by the time they do it. So, uh, yeah. Well, let me, on the last question, and I'm sorry, I'm, because I'm chairing, I'm focusing on my last, I'll finish on the la this last question. Sure, of course. From a national society, if we want to harness, we want to have a real stockpile of these user innovators, what are the kind of capabilities we should be teaching in our classes, teaching in our educating, so that when necessity is the mother of invention, that they have the capabilities or they have the wherewithal to actually create these things? Yeah, well, a big help is, and we do a lot of it as MIT, is makerspaces. Now, one of the things that is not so good is we also do hackathons. You've probably heard of those. Yeah. But the problem with those is that the students don't deeply know the problem. What, what is more effective is when that nurse says, I can use that ventilator on two people, as opposed to saying to an engineering student who doesn't know anything, you know, could you figure this out? Because the student can't. So what really we want is for those people to have experience with actually creating things so that when they get into a use situation themselves, they know how to help themselves. Yeah. 
Okay, and we should teach them also about things like GitHub and open source software and so on. So they also have the tools for collaboration when they get to that point. Okay, well, Professor Van Hippel, I wish to thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you again. Uh, the audience has been sending in dozens or uh, more questions than I've seen for anybody. And I, given I'm a slow reader, it's been causing me nervousness trying to read them and to keep, keep consciousness. But I'd like to thank you for an excellent talk. I would really like to thank you for all the work you've done and how generous you have been both in terms of your digital copies of the books that are available for everybody. And I encourage you to look at them, everybody who's listening. And I just like to thank you very You're much welcome. for your time. You're welcome. I'm really so happy that I've been able to help, you know, and, and it's kind to what you say. And, and, you know, I get letters from Kenya and so on all the time saying, isn't it great that I can get these books free? And, and it makes me very happy. So glad it makes you happy too. But it does. So listen, at the strange times, I wish you and your family to be safe and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully our paths will cross physically again. And I'd like to thank the community and uh, we'll end it there. So thank and you. Thanks to all the community for listening. Thank, thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, bye. Bye-bye now.